Welcome to ADHD is over, a new podcast on a seemingly old label that we're going to be peeling off. Join my wife, Tatiana, and I as we journey with our family, the Wyden family, through the land of confusing information. We're going to visit both sides and let you decide because the power is with you. Welcome to ADHD is over. Hello and welcome back to our podcast. My guest today is Peter R. Bregan, MD. Dr. Bregan is a Harvard trained psychiatrist and former consultant at the National Institute of Mental Health, who has been called the conscience of psychiatry for his many decades of successful efforts to reform the mental health field. His work provides the foundation for modern criticism of psychiatric diagnoses and drugs and leads the way in promoting more caring and effective therapies. His research and educational projects have brought about major changes in the FDA-approved full prescribing information or labels for dozens of antipsychotic and antidepressant drugs. He continues to educate the public and professions about the tragic psychiatric drugging of America's children. Dr. Bregan has authored dozens of scientific articles and more than 20 books, including the Ritalin Fact Book, Talking Back to Ritalin, and the bestseller Toxic Psychiatry. As a medical legal expert, Dr. Bregan has unprecedented and unique knowledge about how the pharmaceutical industry too often commits fraud in researching and marketing psychiatric drugs. Most recently, Dr. Bregan has turned his attention to the misuse of science surrounding COVID-19 and its origins in what he calls global predators. Dr. Bregan and his wife, Ginger R. Bregan, have written a new book, COVID-19 and the Global Predators, We Are the Prey. I am honored and excited to welcome Dr. Peter Bregan. Well, I'm delighted to be here, sir. Um, I think we're going to have a lot of fun together and enlighten the world about things they need to hear about. Yes. And thank you so much. I know you're a busy man. Uh, You've written books, you've done articles, you've traveled the world. Uh, You're an expert uh, in in legal cases. And I'm really excited because, you know, for most parents, you're sort of, you're an expert that's out of reach, right? They can't just call up and go like, Hey, what should I do here? I was, uh, my son was diagnosed and, you know, they're trying to give him Ritalin and what should I do? So my intention really is to get from your expertise and from your knowledge, give some of those nuggets to our listeners, um, mostly parents with children with ADHD or adults uh, with ADHD. So I'm gonna start with a simple question that I get a lot. What is this thing called ADHD? Like, what is it? I know that's a loaded question, but I'm sure you have some great things to say about that. Well, yes, and I had planned to to go off on quite a dissertation about it. but you put in the word parents coming to see me. So I'm going to instead uh, start with that. What do I do to help somebody who walks in the office? So mom and dad and junior, who's uh, 10 years old, let's say somewhere between six and 10 maybe, comes in to see me. And uh, dad is there and mom is there and the little boy is there and probably no other members of the family. And um, little uh, Timmy uh, is um, just uh, just uh, fidgeting around and and, uh, moving. And mom says uh, something about, you see his behavior. And um, Timmy makes a face at mom. And uh, I look over at dad and dad's doing nothing. Typically, he's just like he's been brought along like luggage or something. And um, I'm watching for a few minutes and and Timmy is... uh, just getting really, uh, really anxious and um, because he's in a setting and nobody's giving him any rules or instructions or anything. And um, I look at him and I say, oh boy, how are you today? And everybody's silent. That's that's how a psychiatrist behaves. They never heard of such thing. Been three or four others and they just sat there like dad does. They just sat there without intervening at all. And I say, how are you? He said, all right. I say, um, well, did your folks tell you anything about uh, ADHD and, and what is it? He said, no, no. Well, uh, they gave me a book. I have broken breaks in my brain. 
oh, you read the book about your car and you're speedy and you're wonderful, but you need better brakes? Yeah. I said, oh, wow, that's interesting. But I've been watching you and you know what's going on? What? I said, you're a brat. She said, what? I said, yeah, I love brats. I was worse than you. I, I mean, I would have been looking like I'm going to punch you in the nose if you talk to me, even in the doctor's office. <laughs> I'm not going to put up with anything. And he's glued to me. And we had a conversation about being a boy, about, you know, do parents understand you? How do you feel about things? And he pretty much has a good conversation with me. And that goes on for about six minutes. And then I say, well, you're cured. He said, what do you mean? I said, Look at you. You've been so glued to me. We're having such a fabulous conversation. So then maybe dad intervenes and he says, yeah, Timmy, I, I tell him all the time that uh, he can just control himself. And Timmy starts to fidget right away again. And I say, oh, calm down, Timmy. Dad, I really, I really got your point. I, but I want to show something. I mean, Timmy, you're perfectly capable of having a fairly high level conversation with me. You understand that you're, you're pretty much uh, just a brat. He says, that's uh, and he looks at me and he said, there's nothing wrong with my brain. And I said, no, 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 no. He said, well, mom, mom and dad said that you don't, you don't, that's the one thing they told me, you don't believe in giving the drugs and, uh, that I'm taking now. And I said, well, what do you think about the drug? What is it doing for you? And he looks over his mother and his father and he looks at me and he's not going to tell me. I said, I, um, I bet you... You, you tell your parents they help you. I, and he says, I tell everybody, yeah, they help me. I said, I haven't. how do they help you? Well, people like me better when I take my drugs. I say, oh, I get that, kid. Oh, boy, I get that. And I say, you know, you know what? Um, would you come sit over here a little closer to me? And he just leaps out of his chair and he comes and he sits on the footstool next to me and I put an arm around him. And I say, you know, Timmy, you're just a wonderful kid. I'm really proud. I, if you were my kid, I'd be really proud to have you. There's nothing whatsoever wrong with you. And I, he says, well, ADHD? What? Don't I have ADHD? I said, no, Timmy, that was something made up to tell teachers uh, that their kids need drugs. He said, really? And I said, yeah, there's this not a thing in the world wrong with you. I said, Look, we could go out and have lunch together. You'd be... You'd just be so good because I'm engaging you. He said, I bet you're bored in school. And he says, I am bored. I, know, I don't like it. Well, what's the matter? Well, there's a kid that bullies me when I go to school. Now, he probably wouldn't say that. He's a little Joey or something. And we talk a little bit about that. I'd say, have you talked to your parents about that or the doctors that you've seen before me about that? No, he said, I don't talk about that. Well, I understand, Timmy. When I was bullied in school, I never talked to anybody about it. I just handled it as best as I could on my own. Um, I got some good news for you, Timmy, um, and for mom and dad. Um, you're entirely normal. You don't need the drugs. If I can talk your parents into it, we're going to start withdrawing you today. And coming off these drugs is not a big deal as some other drugs. Uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, mom, did you, did you uh, take him off on the weekends? Oh, yeah. He's fine on the weekends. He has a lot of friends in the neighborhood. They go out and they play and stuff. He's, he's really fine if he's out playing. And I said, well, you know, that's what a normal kid is like. And um, I said, well, let me think about that. Now, does he start to get a little uh, weird after he's been off the drugs before school starts on Monday? He's, she said, well, I, I noticed, yeah, he, he, he gets, um, oh, he starts to eat a lot. On Sundays, I noticed that. Well, I said, that's withdrawal. The drug is suppressing his eating, and then he comes off. He gets hungrier. He starts to eat, and that's normal. He's filling up his body. That's not abnormal. That's all normal. So, well, it sounds to me like um, we could just um, take him off in a couple of steps this week. And, um, and, and uh, mom says, meanwhile, dad said nothing. So I say, mom says, uh, well, I'll tell the teachers. And I said, well, mom, this is going to be hard for me to say, but um, I advise you don't tell the teachers because he may be a little jumpier coming off 
and they're going to figure it out. And then they're going to just come down on Jimmy, maybe privately or come down on you. See, the teachers are really confused about this. I said, in fact, if you, if you pick up the diagnostic manual and, and you look at what is the diagnosis of uh, ADHD, it's just a list of things that uh, teachers have trouble with. That's how they marketed it. Every single one of the things like um, here, often leave seat in situations. That's the first, uh, that's the second one. The first is often fidgets or taps hands or feeds, squirms in the seat. Notice that in seat stuff. I mean, how many times are kids quote in seats? It's in school. So this is a marketing thing. They listed all these things and then they gave a drug that subdues children. They could have actually done this with any, a whole bunch of drugs subdue people. So, but this was the easiest one that they could just uh, market. And uh, that's a little history behind it. But, um, you know, this drug, Jimmy, just, you know, he blurts out answers before question has been completed. I mean, this is obviously for school. Nobody seems to notice that. The whole setup was marketing it, making a fortune, convincing teachers that, uh, that these kids fidget in class because they have a disease rather than the class is too big. The child's not up to reading level. The child's the youngest in the class. Oh, I'm the youngest in the class, Timmy says. I said, well, that's, you know, that, that's a lot of the kids are, Timmy, because, you know, you, know, you, you, you grow and you, you learn how to, you know, not fidget in class. You, you, I'm not even sure it's a good thing, people, who stop fidgeting in class. Um, I, I, I train myself not to fidget in class, Timmy. I train, my, i tell you something funny, Timmy. I trained myself in class to look like I was fascinated by what the teacher was saying. This was especially when I got older, like high school, and I began to realize what I was interested in and what I wasn't. So I could look as if I'm fascinated and I would be doing all kinds of things in my head. I was editor of my newspaper, but I would have been diagnosed with something and I'd be maybe working on an article or something else. I said, and then the funniest thing happened I could do that in college a lot too. And then I went to medical school and I realized that everything they were teaching me was important. And I couldn't do that anymore. <laughs> and I had, to, I had to really learn to pay attention, but it wasn't so hard because I'd always been paying attention to myself. Now I was paying attention more and more to what I was learning. And so, you know, you grow, you learn to do different things. He said, you know, I do that. I try, you, you try to do what? I try to look at the teacher and they, you know, just have my thoughts because if she catches me looking out the window and I'm having my thoughts, she gets really mad. But if I'm looking at her having my thoughts, she doesn't know. I said, yeah, you see, we learn all these things. And that was one of, You're so bright. I look forward to just um, talking with you a lot, except I don't think you need me to talk with you. Oh, I want to come back next time. Dad looks like, let's get out of here. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Mom, mom's looking like, oh, this would be wonderful. And I'm thinking, oh, all right, well, we, we haven't talked with your parents yet, Timmy, because you see, everything I'm telling you, I'm going to help your parents change. And you don't have any psychiatric problems, Timmy. I mean, or let's call them psychological problems. You're not sad and depressed. No. You're not terribly anxious. No. You're certainly not what I would call one of these disturbed. Oh, yeah, we have disturbed kids in special class. They, they look weird. Just, no, you're none of those things. So, Timmy, you're going to get better and really do well because there's nothing wrong with you to start with. And we're going to talk about that some more today. We still have plenty of time. So let me get back now to, uh, and mom says, um, Oh, dad says, maybe I'm, I'm what dad says. Well, we have this psychological testing of Timmy and he has frontal lobe dysfunction. His executive functions are not good. And he's not, um, you know, he's, he's unable to, um, uh, oh God, I was going to say he can't focus, but I guess we're saying he can really focus, can he? Yeah, he can really focus. And I bet he's really good on his uh, computer, isn't he? Oh, yes. <laughs> That, yeah, I can't pull him away from the thing. Oh, yeah, I can't. Well, you know, it, you know, life isn't such that you have a dysfunction in your brain that allows you to work great in computers and talk to interesting people like me, but you can't work in school. I mean, it doesn't sound like maybe it's more the school than to me. I mean, really. And dad perks up and he says, I've thought that. You know something? 
okay, I'm going to say it. I noticed that if I'm around the boys, like four or five boys and they're playing, the boys quiet down. They seem to respond to me different than to say if uh, my wife comes in. They don't just quiet down. I say, yeah, you see, a lot of these boys are missing dad. So that's the next thing we're going to talk about, dad. You got so much to contribute here, dad. And I suspect that mom has her hands full because I noticed you haven't said much today. No, and this is not a criticism. You've been told you can't do anything. I have been told I can't do anything, he says angrily. Okay. All right. Well, I get it. I'm angry too. I'm going to help you uh, with that. So let's just go look at that for a minute, Dad. And this, by the way, is how I'd run an interview. We're just talking about we're going to one hour. They're going to know 90 percent of the important things. I get around to it. And I say, Dad, um, when was the last time you and Timmy went out? Um, well, I, uh, two weeks ago, um, I took him to the hardware store with me. I'm very busy. You know, I'm in the middle of my work and everything. I said, yeah, uh, but he said, you know, Timmy really doesn't want to do anything with me. I asked him to go out with me. He doesn't want to go out with me. I say, Timmy, um, who, by the way, is sitting near me and is just stock still. I mean, this kid's nervous system is cured magically. He is stock still. <laughs> and by the way, they, they say that in the uh, ADHD diagnostic thing, they say that, um, don't, don't be misled if he pays really good attention where he's getting a lot of interest, like in a doctor's office or a one-to-one -one or in a, in a very well-controlled situation. Some of these boys do very well in those situations. It actually says that in the diagnostic manual. Really? Yeah, I haven't checked five for that, but uh, all up until then, it's always said that. And uh, it seems people seem to miss it. It's just two lines or so under related features. So, I mean, it's a ridiculous diagnosis. It's, it's nothing. It's just a way of selling drugs. I, I mean, I hate to say that, but it's the fact. It is a way of selling drugs. They marketed it to the teachers, then the parent groups. They paid parent groups uh, like Chad and uh, and other groups to market it to the uh, to the to the parents and stuff. And and this is, by the way. Um you know, I've done a lot of research on that as well. That's that's public knowledge. Well, not even public knowledge. It's available to the public when you Google these connections. And even on Wikipedia, there's certain psychiatrists and psychologists that, that shows how much income they make from being a speaker or consultant for pharmaceutical companies, right? Yeah. So this is, you're saying this also based on research and knowledge, and I'm doing the same thing, and it's out there. But how come, what do you think, why do parents... Uh, still reach so quickly or get so quickly sold on these stimulant drugs. And, and they actually- well, you're just... about to hear because you're listening into my ah, session. I love it. <laughs> That's great. Please so, continue. Yeah. So dad says, well, you know, dad was just explaining it. He says, I'm really busy. And, you know, uh, his two older uh, sisters, they haven't had these kind of problems and- uh, you know, and, you know, I just thought it was Timmy. And that's what they told me. They'd say, well, your two other brothers, two other sisters don't have these problems. So it's clearly not parenting. It's Timmy's brain. They say, but, you know, no two children, I say, have the same family. I've had sis twin sisters together and they describe their families differently because one was chosen to be the older, came first, one was chosen to be the younger, one was chosen this and that, and uh, and they don't even remember the same things from childhood. So um, it's really complicated. Don't, and, and and girls are more docile by, by uh, genetics or force. I'm not sure which it is. If we had a society in which women weren't clobbered harder at age two for running around or than boys, um, I'm not sure how it would be, uh, whether women would be more docile, but they sure are more docile. And especially when they're young, they'll respond to, to, to uh, women much more than boys will, who are angry and frustrated about not seeing dad enough. But he doesn't want to see me. Well, let's start from fresh. What do you say? Say, Timmy, why don't you, um, I see you're getting a, a little fidgety sitting here. No wonder your dad's a little upset and you're sitting in an awkward place. You, where, how, where would you like to sit? I want to sit at the floor, on the floor. So he gets on the floor at my legs. 
<laughs> he's sitting on the floor in front of me. <laughs> he's got the power behind him to, and the love. He's feeling the love. And soon he's going to feel his parents' love. That's my goal before the session's over. It's a goal I've never heard, heard any other psychiatrist say. But at the end of the session with a child, you want the child to feel the parents' love. That's it. You can do that. <clears throat> You've done a thousand years of marvelous work. You might even get to heaven on that one accomplishment. So we go back to this difficult thing. So I say, Dad, well, how long have you been so busy? Uh, probably the last eight, nine, ten years. It's just been something. And Timmy's how old? Oh, God, he says, I never thought about that, Doc. You got me thinking, Doc. I think you're a good guy, Doc. I try to be, sir. Uh, but it's not easy, he says. He's feeling sympathetic now. He says, because you're not like any of the other docs. Uh-uh, yells Timmy. I said, well, you not. I said, well, well, how am I not like the other docs, Timmy? Timmy says, uh, have you ever tried to talk to a wall with ears and a pad? And mother says, well, the last one was behind a computer. So you've never even had the opportunity to sit with your doc. <laughs> I laugh and he laughs and we're all laughing now. And I say, you see, guys, this is not you. I'm not blaming you. We go, you're going about your lives. You're living, you're living your lives. You've got lots of pressures. Uh, it's very hard to, for, to be a stay at home mother nowadays. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on upwardly mobile people, um, boys, we're raising, trying to raise our boys without religion, without values. Uh, they don't have a, much stability. Um, teachers don't know, they're not taught how to relate to kids. They're taught to identify their diseases. They're taught to look around a room and say, ADHD, I'll refer the child. They're not taught to look around the room and say, oh, kids look a little uneasy. I think I'll stand by him for half of my chat today with the class. Maybe put a hand on his shoulder. You know, they'd be afraid to touch nowadays, not just because of COVID, which is right in line with all this and what it does to our kids and our parents, but they'd just be afraid to touch uh, even before COVID often. Um, so I say, well, look, here's, here's what I think. I really think we need to see that Timmy gets more time with his dad. That, that's my number one prescription because mom, you've been doing all the engaging with me today. And, you know, it's really hard for a mother nowadays to be the disciplinarian of a child. She said, oh, God. You know, we've been trying to say that with my friends. We've been talking about it. We never got it, really. We've been saying this with my friends. We've never quite gotten it before. Of course, we're all, we're all like either partially working or working mothers and uh, or if we're home full time, we've got a, a boy to deal with. And, and I noticed that we we're all, we we're all, uh, gosh, my friend Jane, I can't wait to tell her about this. Do you have more room for another? I said, well, we'll talk about that later. That's his focus here. Um, but you know what? She is, she's divorced and she's trying to force her husband, her husband's a nice man. We, we knew them both together and then they got separated and she's going to court to try to force her husband to give her son drugs. And, and she's, got the, the, she's got the child most of the time and the father's saying, I don't have any trouble with him. He's quite, the, quite good around me. She, she, I never realized that it's impossible for a mother to raise a, a boy on her own if the boy is full of gumption. It's really hard. I said, that's right. I said, I remember once um, talking to a young, young boy and saying, well, <clears throat> why do you listen to me immediately, but not your mother? And he said, well, your voice is so much darker. Men's voices are made to command. Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry if this is going to offend some people, but men's voices are made to command and women's voices are made to calm us with love. Now it gets all confused and there are many calm and loving men. I had to work on it so hard to be a calm and loving man, but there are plenty of women who just naturally are calming and loving. So their heads are spinning. I say, I'm talking too much now. So I want to get down to business. Timmy, would you like to spend more time with your father? Uh -huh. Oh God, Timmy, he says, I'm sorry. And he cries. Stone-faced dad is crying. I said, Dad, 
I, I want to help with this. The single most important thing we can do for Timmy as a start is for you to, to have him know that he is going to spend time with you every single weekend for a few hours, enough to tire you guys out, and that the project will be based on Timmy's needs, not yours. So you won't be taking him to just a movie to watch, or you won't be taking him to the hardware store. <laughs> we talked about that earlier. So that you'll be going to uh, the kids' museum, or you'll be going to uh, play ball, or go for a walk, uh, maybe take a friend of his with you. That's okay, too, and do something together. As long as you're there and Timmy's enjoying it and Timmy is learning from you that he's loved and he's disciplined, that he's a young boy who's being disciplined like his dad, who is disciplined down to his core. And, Dad, you might loosen up on some of your discipline. We'll get a little... Maybe you'll get a little wilder and Timmy you'll get a little more control because there's going to be benefits here for everybody. That's the first thing we're going to do. And then I want to figure out a way, as busy as you are, that Timmy knows every day of the week that there's a ritual with you. And that's going to be our start. And Timmy, I have instructions for you too. I have something for you to do. And Timmy is looking a little baffled. And I said, well, Timmy, I understand that you've been told you have no control over this. He said, oh, yeah. That's exactly what Dr. Jones told me. I said, that, that Timmy, um, I'd like to pop Dr. Jones right in the nose, frankly. And he laughs. He said, that's the worst thing you could tell a human being. That's how you destroy people. You tell them they have no control. It's ridiculous. You've got a lot of look at you. You've been the most controlled kid I've seen in a long time. You're really, you're actually, you know, a lot better off than some of the kids I see. They have other things on top of the uh, being diagnosed with ADHD. They've been abused. I don't think you've been hit at all. <gasps> Silence in the room. Naturally, I look at dad. He shakes his head. Mom says, I slapped him a few weeks ago, and it was the second time in his life I ever slapped him. I was so frustrated, she's crying. I said, Jimmy, run over, give your mother a hug. She needs a little love, and he goes over and gives mom a hug. I think to myself, we're going to be successful today. We are going to be successful. We're gonna hear, and I might even say, certainly in the last 10 years, I might say, thank you, God. We're gonna be successful today. So by the time the session is over, and I think I'll draw the session to a close now, by the time the session is over, dad has a plan to be with his son every weekend. Mom has realized this will open her up to spend time with her youngest daughter, who is still in school, and maybe to get on the phone with her oldest daughter, who's at college. She's going to spend some time on the weekend so the girls know that, uh, that she's doing something more special with them. And there's going to be a ritual at night where uh, they work out. One of them's going to read to Timmy or Timmy's going to read to them. Or, and then there's going to be hugs and kisses. And I said, you just, you got to have a ritual of hugs and kisses or people feel terrible without that. I mean, that's... That's what we need. That's our refill is our hugs and our kisses. So we're going to work on that. And I said, well, Timmy, and I, I want to come back to you because I started to talk to you. And we realized that no one had ever asked you to take charge of yourself before. And I'll be just, I'll laugh like that. It's like so anxiety and crazy, these things that they're teaching with our children, these awful people. And um, I don't mean the parents. I mean my doctors and the psychologists and the teachers and people who should know better. And um, I say, Timmy, I want you, if your father looks like he is too busy on Saturday or something, I want you to get your courage up and say, Dad, I do want to do something with you. He looks like, are you kidding? Say, I want you to look at your dad and we're going to make believe that dad looks really busy. Maybe he says, I have to mow the lawn today. Would you do some weeding? And you don't want to do that. They laugh. 
And uh, Timmy says, with more, more encouragement, Daddy, I want to spend time with you today. Son, I'm trying, going to try not to forget. But if I get into that stuff again, where I think I have to be doing stuff like that all the time, I want you or mom to just, you know, tell me. Good. Well, we've got some good working stuff here. Now, I'm going to say something to you, both of you, that I only say in this particular situation. I've been watching that these issues seem to be mostly at home. Is that right? They're not so much at school, even though we've talked about school. They're mostly at home. Yes. I said, well, that's good news because uh, then you can fix it. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. If it turns out that there's some issues at school, then I'm going to say that's good news too, because then the teachers can fix it. We have to take, we take responsibility for our children. These evil people who sell evil drugs that stunt our children's growth and do a lot of horrible things to them. I'm not even going to go over it with you because you're coming off, I presume, and everybody is in agreement. So I'm not even going to tell you. So just forget it. He's going to recover. And um, we're just going to go ahead. And if there's problems at home, we fix them at home. If there's problems at school, we fix them at school. Some, some, you know, some kids get cured by ADHD when they get a male teacher. So others are, are cured of ADHD when they go to a different school. I know a school I've been working with where they don't have ADHD because they pay attention to all the kids. Now, I'm not saying they don't have some disturbed children, you know, who have been really wounded by abuse or something else or have a physical disability that they're having trouble with or whatever. But if, you know, if they're like Timmy, they're out of control children, and that's what ADHD is, undisciplined, out of control kids. I give them all a guarantee, just like that school does. The guarantee is if you stick with me on this once a week for a few weeks, a few weeks, how many is that, Doc? I don't know. Two. Oh, okay. Stick with me for two weeks and you're going to see a total change to me because you're going to teach him loving discipline. You're going to calm him down. I, I thought you'd be going to say like a, a year or something. No, there are some things that adults come to see me for, for a year or two. But we're, we're, we're looking at, uh, at the people right here in the room who fixed Timmy, not me. They fixed Timmy by fixing themselves. And Timmy, I still haven't gotten to do, talk to you about what you're going to do. So, um, no, 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 no. You're going to be able to, you're going to be able to do this. Now, you might want to continue with me if you want to have a more loving marriage. And because I think there's a little, I can tell that there's a little difficulty in communication with you all and we can do that. But if you, if you change these things, Timmy is going to do better. If you adhere to them and you may want refills on adhering and might want to read a couple of my books, right about the, I talk about this stuff, but no, uh, you're going to change and the kids are going to be better. And very often I have families where the kids are better and the parents continue to come to me for several months to unravel all the issues they got from their own childhood and their own difficulties. So now, Timmy, finally, it doesn't matter whether your parents change or not. You have a job in life. Your job is to take care of Timmy so that you can grow up to be a strong and loving man. That's your job. Do you believe in God, Timmy? <gasps> yeah. Well, that's what God wants us to do. And that's what we're here on earth to do. We're here on earth to be strong, loving people who respect each other and go about our lives. So, you got to do that anyway. You got to remember my words. Can I come back again? Oh, I definitely want to see you next week, but uh, you may not need to. You know what, Timmy? You, as you get older, you can always just give me a call or something. But let, let, we'll wait and see about that. I love you. You're a wonderful kid. So you've got to decide for yourself that even if mom and dad don't get it quite right, I have to learn to discipline myself be under good control so I can have a good life. Do you understand me, Timmy? 
Like, I make a good life. Yeah. You make a good life. That's, that's our job, Sam. We have to make a good life. And we all decide in different ways, what is that? Your parents are going to make a better life. They've already made a good life. They're going to make a better life by being closer to you and understanding better what's going on with you. But you have to make a better life, too. And I want you to not push your dad away. You know, um, I understand why he would say, no, I don't want to go out with you. You didn't know why he was saying that. Dad didn't know why. But I want you to, oh, my gosh, you haven't hugged your father. Give him a big hug. And he runs just now, but folks, you may be hearing a lawnmower outside. Um, okay. And I want you to just give your dad a hug. And um, I want you to hug each other now. That's okay. I'll look down at the floor. In fact, I'll go over and fuss around with my appointment schedule. And it's a good session. They're hugging at the end. They've got some good ideas. They're going to change their child's life. And at the same time, I have this feeling of why, why, why doesn't, don't my colleagues get this? Why don't they understand? That's the end of my session, sir. I hope it was enlightening. No, that, that was a beautiful session. And I'm sure a lot of parents can relate. A lot of parents have been in that situation or are going to be in that situation. Uh, thank you for this, this very beautiful circle of, of um, uh, you know, explaining a session. And I have two words that I wrote down. And one is related to something you and I talked about during our last conversation. So the key words that stuck out to me was engagement and then the word dads, which you so uh, geniusly uh, uh, coined as the, the dad attention deficit syndrome, right? So it's could you maybe- D-A-D-D, -D, dad attention deficit. The deficit, sorry, D -A -D, yeah, dad, that's right. Um, so could you elaborate on those two, like uh, where that comes from in your research and how, because that's a pretty strong statement, right? And like you said, some people will be triggered. And, and I'm glad because when, when we're triggered, there's room for conversation. So what about the dads not being, is, is that related to mostly boys having ADHD or how does that fit in? No, it fits with both boys and girls. I mean, there is a natural <clears throat> tendency behind the old phrase, wait till dad gets home. Now, it's not a good idea to threaten children with their fathers, but the presence of a male quiets all children down. Um, there have been uh, observational studies and anecdotes forever about simple things like an out of control school auditorium that's been going on for long gets under control when two or three dads come into the room. Mm -hmm. They make their presence known. Hi, boys and girls, glad to be here today. It changes things. Mm -hmm. We evolved to have two parents. And we evolved for both parents to love the children and care for them and protect them. And it actually doesn't take a village to raise a child. It takes a village to raise a communist, maybe. <laughs> but to raise a healthy, normal child, it takes two parents supported by other people usually during evolution we didn't have villages the first village is ten thousand years ago so for the million years or so of evolution we can pick any arbitrary starting time from when we evolved from mm -hmm. <clears throat> we can go back to the very beginning or say a million years when we're little creatures running around uh, it was mostly extended families and we, we went around in extended families. The father was the hunter and the protector, and the mother was the gatherer, nurturer. Um, <clears throat> and there was a, an extended family giving support, especially to the mom, which mothers really, really need. Mom, create an extensive family for yourself of some kind, artificially, if, if, if you must. Um, and the father was there and taught the kid to hunt and fish and make his own clothes and make his own spear, his bow and arrow later on, and so on. It was 
a training by the family in the growing up process. And uh, we don't have that anymore. And we have to reconstruct it in some way. And the fathers have been literally told that, that all these problems with the kids are suitable for the drug companies. We've just made a market of children. We market <clears throat> everything in the world to them from uh, you know, vaccines and uh, to uh, ADHD drugs, to antidepressant drugs, to you know, whatever else we're marketing. Children, this huge market that, that are, as long as you can get the parents and the teachers involved, I mean, the, the kids have no say in the market. Um, the, uh, the, the dad's influence is such that, uh, I remember in one, uh, uh, a year or two ago, um, we had a very similar situation of a young girl who was out of control and the two older siblings who were very cooperative and had grown up and this little girl was out of control. And, um, I started to, to talk about dad's role. And the first thing dad tells me is, uh, no, I mean, I just spent two hours with her yesterday. We went for a walk. We did this, we did that. Um, and, um, mom said, well, I've been very busy. You know, my husband's been really kind. I've started my own business. And so he's been uh, doing everything. And I said, well, you know, I, I noticed, um, in the session yesterday when, 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 uh, you were here with your little girl, that dad, you didn't do much discipline. And mom says, he's terrible at discipline. And then she laughs and she says, you know, I think I loved, loved him a lot for that. That I knew he was never gonna discipline me like my father did. I said, boy, that is on target. I said, you know, we marry people for reasons that fit with us. Exactly like you said, you meet a man who is just never gonna discipline you. And um, he gets less and less able to discipline anybody as the years go on and you get more bossy. And it just, she said, boy, is that ever true? And I said, well, we gotta, you know, just, we'll reverse that one, but let's just focus now. So you spend a lot of time, you, you, this is not that attention deficit disorder. She said, no, sometimes I think she gets too much of me. I do have trouble disciplining her. I said, well, give me an example. Well, yesterday she was just, uh, you know, watching the video games, playing these video games. I could see she was tired. I could see that she wasn't doing her homework. Um, mom was going to come home soon and uh, things won't have gone very well. And I was actually afraid to tell her to, you know, settle down and do homework with me. She said, that's, a, that's awful. He looks at me and he says, that's just awful. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, thank you. I'm afraid of my own daughter. I'll bet you were scared as heck of my mother, of your own mother. And he said, I didn't have a mother. I had a grandmother. And I was scared to death of her, Doc. I lost my mother when I was five. Let me talk about that for a little bit. We may do some of what I would call, you know, analytic kinds of insight oriented therapy like that's not it's not psychoanalytic the psychoanalysts were a mad cult of their own um it, it's just common sense looking at family life um, and he decides he makes up his mind he said well you know for god's sakes i i don't need to be afraid of my own daughter i said no and you know if you want to come and have a separate session we could talk about dealing with you what it was like losing your mother dealing with your grandmother but um he says, I don't think I need that, Doc. I know just what I need to do. I need to man up with my own daughter. What an embarrassing thing to realize. I said, well, that is great news. That is great news. I tell you what, you're going to uh, fix this situation probably in, in a week or two because your daughter's going to see it right away. In fact, tell your daughter, go home, tell your daughter, I've just learned something, Jenny. I've been scared of you. I'll bet you know it yourself. And she looks like I've been caught or something. She's not going to tell him. He says, well, I think so. I think I've been scared of you. No more, dear. That is terrible. From now on, when I give you a recommendation, 
I don't want you smirking at me like you just did. I don't want you giving me a hard time, honey. I don't want you, I don't want you doing anything but saying, okay, dad, or, well, dad, can we talk about it for a minute? You know, either one of those, okay, dad, or can we talk about it? Well, can we talk about this? What, what do you want to say? And she bursts into tears and runs away, goes into her room. The next time we get together, he's made some progress. And I said, but what did you do? He says, I, I don't know. I didn't, I'd let her cry in the room. You didn't go in and talk to her and say everything's going to be okay? Remember, remember uh, Jake, she needs you to reassure her while you're disciplining her that everything's going to be okay. Do you know that a father looking at a child saying everything's going to be okay is the best thing in the world? I'll tell you a, a quick little, you know, I don't get in this too much, but during the Blitz at Great Britain, they sent all the children out of London into the suburbs to be wonderful British families. They didn't do so good. They wanted to be with their parents. They did better in the Blitz with loving, brave parents. So that's how much you matter. You matter more than the Blitz, more than bombs bursting. So I want you to go and reassure her that everything's going to be fine because you just love her to pieces. You love her, but she's going to be listening. And in two or three th weeks, things really straighten out. Dad needed some more help. Folks, this is really what it is. It's... Uh, it's a, it's a fake diagnosis to disrupt family life and to get the ability of the drug companies to sell toxic substances to children, drugs that are known to be addictive, amphetamines, and even the ones that aren't addictive or, or overstimulating or mind blunting. They're going to either drive the kids into this withdrawal that they get from amphetamines or into being numb from antidepressants, it's going to disable their brain. The only way the psychoactive substance works is disabling the brain. You want hallucinations on LSD? It's maybe you may think it's great, but you badly disabled your brain. You want to be calm on marijuana? Okay, but you're disabling your brain. You want to have you know, two whiskeys before you sit down with your wife in the evening, well, you're not going to have the same kind of intimacy you would have without two whiskeys. You're disabling your brain. Smoking cigarettes, you're disabling your brain. Every psychoactive substance, all the psychiatric drugs do it more than most of the other psychoactive drugs. They do because they're made to do that. You know how you, you get a, a psychiatric drug, you know how you determine you can you have a drug that you could try to pass before the ADA, uh, before the uh, FDA? Um, you demonstrate first to the FDA that it's disrupting one or another brain dysfunction, brain function. So you say, see, it's blocking dopamine like the other uh, antipsychotic drugs. You see, it's jacking up... Uh, the uh, norepinephrine and serotonin and dopamine, just like the other drugs, so it's a stimulant. In other words, you show that you're harming the brain, damaging the brain, therefore you have a model for a psychiatric drug. That's the frank, honest, unequivocal truth. And the only reason it isn't taught to medical students is the power of the drug companies and all the people who make money from the drug companies, the billionaires, the doctors, everybody, the psychologists, and the teachers who don't know what's going on but think their kids are better off when they are less spontaneous. If you give normal free-ranging chimpanzees these drugs, the same thing happens to them happens to the children. They stop petting each other. That's that's good. You don't want chimps petting in class, do you? They stop mm, the way they do with each other. They stop exploring. Yeah, you don't want your chimps exploring the classroom. So we turn our kids into caged animals by caging their brains. We don't want to do this, folks. The long so I'm just now gonna take a minute and go down the litany of misinformation about these drugs, because probably nobody is Spend as much time as this as I have, as much as it pains me, I will go through this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.
there are no biochemical balances in the brains of children who have, quote, ADHD because there's no disease entity. It's a lack of learning to be disciplined, if it's anything. It's also a lot of times a normal kid in a bad classroom, then you change the classroom. I want to get that straight. Or maybe a normal kid in a normal family, and, and they have to learn to adapt to a very energetic child. But mostly it's what I've been describing to you. Mostly it's just a great kid whose parents aren't giving enough engagement and enough discipline. Often there's enough love, but not enough engagement, not enough discipline. So, so there's no disease entity. There's no biochemical markers. There's no genetics. It's all baloney. The only genetics is these kids are younger usually than other kids in the classroom. There's a genetic cause for you. They're younger. <laughs> All right, so there's no biochemical imbalances, but there is a terrible imbalance in multiple neurotransmitters with the first dose you give of any drug for ADHD. Multiple. So they've lied to you and said your kid is a biochemical imbalance, and then they get you to cause a biochemical imbalance in the brains of your child. So that's it. The... Um, they scare, they scare you by saying that if you don't give your kids medications, they will go all up and be criminals and be mentally ill and be all these other things. This is called lying. Lying. They will lie for power and money. And if you don't think that is feasible, the same thing is going on with, with COVID-19. They are lying about vaccines, lying about there's no good drug treatments, we have great drug treatments. Just you go to Bregan.com to my coronavirus uh, uh, resource center, go to YouTube and you'll see all the great, I have the best doctors I work with, the best doctors in the world. And by the way, on the ADHD thing, I had almost no doctors willing to take a stance on this, very, very few. But there are so many good doctors taking a stance on vaccines and taking a stance on the good treatments that are available, the good treatments that are available. So many, many doctors, I interview them, it's just wonderful, they're wonderful family men and women, and you know, they're just, just great people. Um, I could never get that interest up in families really great families uh, so much around the issue of uh, these drugs because it was so isolated, but now people seeing that the drug company is doing this to the whole society. Um, so- and it, It's also, <clears throat> um, sorry to interrupt, but it's also always so surprising to me that, and you've been in many legal cases where drug companies were then asked to pay millions of dollars, right? Whether yeah. they settled or damages and they just, shrug it off. And then I feel like we can Google all these things. They're available, but people don't hear about it. So nobody would ever say, well, the same drug company that I'm going to get a vaccine from, you know, they had a lawsuit that was like, they paid $300 million to someone for damages or to multiple people, but that's okay. That's the past. You know, why do we just ignore that? Why do people just go Literally, they just see that company today for who they are, and and none of these things in the past can cast any shadow of doubt for people. Why do you think that is? Why do we? Is it the fear of death? Is it? Is it? What is it? Well, this gets really heavy. Um, it's very hard for all of us to face evil, and it is also very hard for people to realize what I'm about to say, and yet it's so clear from history, which is until the advent of the founding of America, people always lived in slavery to the elite. They always lived in slavery to the powerful people. Now that is not our nature though, because all that begins only probably five, 6,000 years ago. It begins um, no earlier than 10,000 years ago, and then only spotily when we had villages, and maybe then somebody could take over the village. Because when we were um, a group of nomads wandering around, looking for food, escaping danger, 
for hundreds of thousands of years as sentient human beings, um, we took care of ourselves. So the, the worst tyranny you could have would be that uh, some bunch of young men in the group, or maybe an old man or two decided he was going to run the family. That's a little hard to do when everybody in the family hunts for their own food, <laughs> gathers for themselves. They share some of it, but it always starts with the individual, makes their own clothing. How are you going to bully people like that endlessly? How are you going to pre prevent somebody just from coming up behind you and knocking you on the back of the head with a rock? So we didn't have to tell Terrence, and that is not how we lived. And, and it's a lie that we had communism. No, we had extended families, which is the rock bottom of liberty. We had extended families with free, responsible individuals cooperating together, hunting mastiffs and mastodons together, hunting and gathering together, but as free individuals agreeing on this as family members. And uh, you know, assume being first responders all the time. You know, I never thought that all, everybody's a first responder. Um, so for the but once once we went into villages, and then into civilizations, it's a history of human beings being enslaved. And I remember going to Europe and s sitting and listening to lectures at you know at the Tower of London or wherever else in front of some palace. And it would be a history of human beings abusing massively other human beings for religious reasons, supposedly for nationalist reasons or whatever. But always oh, just because human beings get power and they bully and take over and they abuse people. So one of the things that helps me a lot, and I've never heard anybody other than me talk about in quite this way, is that our history for 10,000 years has been subservience against our basic nature. And there have always been people who lust for power. Maybe those people were very useful during evolution because they would come through at a time of starvation or when one group of people was assaulting another group of people. Um, or when we were meeting a, another group of humans that was uh, different enough from us that we thought we had to defend ourselves from them by attacking them or whatever weird thing we were trying to manage. But so maybe those used to the really great, powerful person who could uh, really intimidate and fight and stuff like that. But those people never got some sort of total totalitarian power. There was no way to do it. You don't see it in indigenous societies. Native American societies are not run by a violent chief. They're run by a core discussion. Sometimes the women are in charge of the war councils, like it happened with the Iroquois Nation. God, I'm putting stuff together in a way I haven't before. Um, folks are hearing the beginning of what's going to be a very small book someday. So we human beings have been used to abuse and control forever of kings, czars, whatever else, forever. But the forever is very short. Then along comes the founding of America. And what do they say? We don't owe allegiance to anyone but God. That's what it says in the Declaration of Independence, which people aptly describe as the preamble to the Constitution that uh, by God or God, nature's God, uh, which was kind of saying, you know, if the scientists come into nature's God, nature, moral morality coming out of nature, God and nature, um, that we have human rights. And the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And in fact, it would have been life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, and property. But there was such a confusion about what property meant in terms of slavery, because the slaves were being claimed as property that they decided, decided not to face the slavery issue, because that was the, the one thing they, this huge uh, evil compromise they made. Uh, to have a nation, they, they had to have the South. 
South would have joined with Great Britain against them. I mean, it was just an awful situation, awful situation. They compromised. They don't even mention the right to property for fear that the, that it'll encourage slavery, but they don't want to, to have, you know, it's just very, it's a mess. So, but it's really life, liberty, pursuit of happiness and property, because that's what appears in other, other discussions. And this was unique. The government was formed not to control you and exploit you and be a predator against you, but to protect you and to encourage commerce between the states and things like that. It was it was for the people, by the people, of the people, Lincoln's later words. So that's new. What's new, folks, is the liberty we're now losing. The liberty we're now losing is almost ho-hum, and you're seeing people go ho-hum because human beings have been docile before gigantic authority forever. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to be fighting. I am fighting back, and, you know, we're not going to get a lot into that today, but it's a very similar issue. In, in a way, the first people they went after were our children, the people they really went after to, in some ways, uh, experiment on, but also just to control and use and make a market out of were our kids. I mean, they did it to us in different ways, but the kids were the overwhelming market. Very interestingly, in regard to ADHD, um, just before COVID, my big issue was SPAC. We created an organization, SPAC, Stop the Psychiatric Abuse of Children. Mm. Um, with my friend, psychologist Michael Cornwall, we and my wife, we set this organization up. And the reason we set up SPAC was that uh, the company, a company had come up with something called Monarch, a device yep. to put on the heads of kids with so-called ADHD to stimulate their brains throughout the night. I've heard about that, yep. And um, to stimulate their brains by sending low-level electrical impulses into the skin of the head and back up nerve connections, trigeminal nerve connections, and probably other nerve connections backwards up the nerves, because most of the nerves are coming down, to, to, to do what? To muck up your brain overnight to give your brain overnight instead of electrical impulses, hammer blows, bing, 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 coming up your nervous system. At first I thought they were probably going through the skull and we got involved with some engineers and other people. We looked at carefully at this, evaluated it. You'll find SPAC on the website, S-P-A-C-K, Bregan.com. But, um, but no, it turns out this really is low level. And that doesn't mean it's good. It means it's horrible because the brain, instead of resting and recuperating, is being given a low-level counter-stimulation to everything it's ever experienced in its entire life. Well, we, we, got some, we got some coverage on this. We worked on it. And I've heard almost nothing about Monarch. And if anybody has, uh, has heard about kids being put on Monarch and stuff... Um, you know, get in touch with me. Um, you'll you'll find out to get in touch with me on the website. Mm -hmm. um, but um, either it's gone so secret that nobody knows, or maybe with Monarch they found well, we are really going to run up against stuff. There's going to be congressional hearings and so on because we were really tooling up. But that's how bad they are, folks. It's a very good example of. Um, of how bad they are. Now I want to I want to end. Maybe it won't be the end, but I want to end with something I left out. Please, yeah. The the big lie they gave you was that your child would turn out to be abnormal, and that's untrue. There's nothing wrong with kids with ADHD. Um, actually, most of the media people I talk to tell me that they were jumpy and undisciplined, and so the media, these people are having a wonderful time in the media, in the arts and literature, there's some in philosophy, my own wife, Ginger. Um, there was a, one of these sons of guns, I won't even mention his name, said that he could diagnose children with ADHD in a cafeteria because they were moving their legs. 
Oh They'd have God. a leg crossed and they were bouncing their leg. My ginger boy, she she's like a fire. She's bouncing her leg, bouncing her leg, and she's about to come up with something I never even imagined as a deep insight, you know? And and ginger would have been that that would have been enough in today's world. If she was bouncing her leg in class. <laughs> This, and this teacher say read the book, one of these books this guy wrote, and he was a big guy at NIMH, and he's saying, uh, you know, that's a telltale sign, that leg bouncing. <laughs> so some of the best, we, we're actually flattening by drugging these kids, some of the best and the brightest. I wanted to say that. These are not the worst kids, best and brightest. Now, they're not even the trouble kids, you know, they, they get called conduct disorder or... Uh, and then they're often the best in the writers. So they're called, uh, you know, ODD. Uh, what, I don't remember what it even stands for. Uh, what is o o opposition, uh, oppositional defiance? defiance. So, yeah, uh, yeah, oppositional yeah. defiance. I mean, <laughs> these are the words we give to kids who are struggling. Kids who are struggling, oppositional defined disorder. There's a, there's um, a new one that came out called rejection sensitivity disorder. I think it's RSD. And mm -hmm. I'm like, wait. Isn't rejection part of life? That's how we learn and move forward and get stronger, you know? Well, that's one thing, and that's great. But the other thing is, who the heck isn't sensitive to rejection? Yeah, exactly. Show me I a mean, human. That, that's really normal, folks. And if a kid is having a tremendous amount of rejection, mom, maybe dad, maybe big brother has been making it really hard on them. So stupid. Right. There's a, there's a, that's such a good point. But the thing I wanted to finish with, and this is something you none of you your, your people will have heard unless they've looked at uh, some of my books and that is there have been a lot of follow-up studies by the people who gave very low doses of stimulants usually methylphenidate good old Ritalin in the 70s to relatively normal children who did not have any serious problems and the outcomes of these children that they traced are a disaster compared to the other kids who were, you know, equally normal, may have had though some of the same things compared to any kind of normal cohort. These people did horribly. Now, the none of them was on stimulants. Stimulants were and the diagnosis of ADHD were a pathway to being a mental patient for the rest of your life. So these people had obesity very high. Why? They were some, many of them were on antipsychotic drugs. Now, none of these ADHD kids are going to be psychotic when they grow up. None of them. <laughs> none of them. And yet they were becoming psychotic and getting these drugs. Others were becoming depressed and getting antidepressants. They had higher rates of criminality, higher rates of mental hospitalization, and so on. So why was this? This was from a combination of events. First, if you teach a child they can't control themselves, and they grow to believe it when they deal with the difficult things in life, you've ruined them. Because what we need above all things to handle life is the knowledge that we are in control of our own minds, hearts, and spirits. We are. And that's how people get through it. tough. That's how women get through childbirth. That's how men get through hearing their wives scream in childbirth. <laughs> That's how boys grow up on a playground. We need to know we're in charge of ourselves. That's how America was founded. It was founded by a group of people who knew that the men in, who signed the, the Declaration of Independence knew it was a hit list to hang every last one of them if they were caught. And their wives knew it. And Abigail Adams didn't say, don't do that, honey. John, John, you're going to be first on the king's list to be hung if they catch you. Hmm. And he was. King really hated John Adams. That's not what happened. Not a single member who, of a family 
of the men who signed the Declaration of Independence became a turntail. Not one. We don't talk about that. These people knew that what mattered was their relationship to truth, to God, to freedom. They believed in their own abilities and their families had the same strength. At least their wives. They had that same strength. So we rob our kids of everything they need by telling them they have a disease of the brain, a biochemical imbalance, a genetic disorder, or just simply they have ADHD. We rob them. So naturally, many more of them are going to become helpless mental patients. Then also, very often, these kids are put on other drugs for the symptoms they get from the ADHD. They can't sleep at night. It's a stimulant. So they get put on a sedative. They may even get eventually put on Seroquel and told it's a sedative and it's an antipsychotic drug. So they get put on one or another drug. The flattening effect, destruction of spontaneity leaves some of the many kids obviously looking depressed when they're just being crushed by the drug. So they get on antidepressants. So by every measure possible of quality of life, that group of people in the 70s who were put on these drugs ended up in jail, in mental hospitals, on drugs, overweight, sick, more doctor visits than the control population and didn't even need a control population. They were doing so poorly. That's what happens. And they didn't even look at, because they didn't want to, the other issues of addiction because these are addictive drugs. So we have other studies to show that if you take these stimulant drugs as a youngster, you're more likely to become a cocaine abuser when you're in your 20s. Very specific control studies to show this from kids who are in clinics for ADHD and some got drugs and some didn't. And so there was did, also that, that famous study by Nadine Lambert. That that's never the Lambert published. study. Yeah. No, no, some of them did. That's Nadine Lambert's study. And so I, I heard, though, that the main study never got published before you know, she died. In a oh, no, she was hit by a truck. Right. right. On her campus. Yep. So um, I am not aware. I'm sure she had other studies coming, but Nadine has at least two or three studies, one in a book that I did. And um, you'll be able to find those. Okay. I'll tell you, my most recent book, folks, just to know, what's my most recent book on? Yeah, let's talk about your most recent book. Yeah. I mean, I'm just going to mention it. It's called Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal. Mm -hmm. And it talks about how to get your child off all drugs and adults off all drugs. But it also contains my newest summaries of all this stuff. So you're going to see, you just look in the index from the, the Lambert. Okay. And you're going to find uh, some of her studies will be cited. So that that's probably, and it's it's a book for really, uh, for people who don't necessarily love to read. It's a very documented scientific book. But then you can go back also to my earlier books on, on this subject, which are meant for, uh, well, this book, I'll tell you, the Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal, the subtitle it is for um, uh, prescribers, therapists, patients, and their families. So it's for everybody. But my, but it was published by a medical publisher. From my books from a popular publisher, which means that they're a bit more interesting, come okay. out here. One of them is talking back to Ritlin. And the other, another is uh, the Ritlin Fact Book. Mm -hmm. And um, you'll find these on Amazon. You'll find these on my website. Talking Back to Ritlin has a wonderful series of chapters on developing your moral authority. So one of the most striking things I notice about all the families who have undisciplined kids is they don't really believe they're supposed to teach their kids moral authority, let alone impose it on them. They don't, they believe it's wrong. They, they think that, that it'll interfere with the kids' growth and development. And often there were parents who were abused or parents who were over-disciplined or parents who were, you know, not loved well or whatever. And they've promised themselves they won't do that to their own children. They're good people. 
And so they have a terrible time imposing moral authority. Kids need to know you're the moral authority. They don't feel safe. It's no different than a puppy. You know, if your puppy, let's say your two-year-old dog, and, and I don't mean this to demean two-year-old children. I love dogs. Mm -hmm. If your two-year-old dog is allowed to bark like crazy for three minutes leading up to getting fed, that dog will get fed, but it's not, believe it or not, a happy dog. You look at how the dog is behaving, the dog's adrenaline is, is whipped up, the dog is, is yelling and screaming. And then the dog probably at other times is jumpy and fidgety because they think they can get out of control. But if you go up to that dog without ever hitting the dog, the most extreme thing you would do, you would never do to a child, which is, you know, belly him up, never do that to a child. Never use force on a child to get your way. It's an admission you have no power. Never take your child and say, you will listen to me. You are communicating to the child you have no power at all, except brute force and shouldn't be listened to. Always go to your child with love, determination, a sense of your moral authority. And so one of the things I, I do, by the way, your dog will be happier when you impose moral authority on your dog. Be calmer, be more loving, be more peaceful. Somebody's in charge other than them. Little dogs and children are not happy when they think they're in charge. It's too much of a burden, it's too confusing. They don't have developed enough brains yet, literally. So be a kind, loving, moral authority. Do not use force. If you have to use force in your child, you've gone so out of control. How are they going to learn to be in control? <laughs> right, right. So work on it. And parents say, it won't work. I don't even know what moral authority is. I've never had that since. I don't have any authority over my child. I say, that's obvious. We know that. But isn't it wonderful that we know the cause and we know the cure? So I'm gonna work on, with you for a couple of sessions, but you're gonna learn that when you look at your child and you say no, and your child makes a face and you say, I don't respond to faces, but no, honey, come back when you're ready to talk to me about what we're gonna be doing today. And you limit that to really important things. In fact, this is a good point. Start out with imposing your moral authority over one thing only respectful behavior. Don't even worry about chores. Don't even worry about homework. If you develop a relationship of respect for your child, everything else will fall into place. So in a very loving way, when uh, little Joey said, now you say, well, Joey, I'm, I won't even talk with you when you are being disrespectful to me. I'm going to go, you know, and do something in the kitchen. You come in later if you want. Now you don't say, little Joey, I'm not gonna feed you. You'll go hungry or go to your room. You don't need that. You want little Joey to realize he's disappointing you. That's the normal way we learn. I don't wanna disappoint my wife. I don't want to disappoint her mom who lives with us. I don't want them to disappoint me. I want to have just a respectful relationship with them where we, at the minimum, are just so respectful. And out of that flows love easily. So you teach your child. And if you, whether you believe in your moral authority or not, if you hold the line, hold the line, Act like you have moral authority, which means you don't scream, you don't yell, you don't threaten, you don't say go to your room, you just say, I'm not gonna relate to you in those terms. So when you want something from me, you come back and be respectful. Are you gonna make me do my homework tonight? That's disrespectful. What do you mean? Your tone, it just got a little worse. I won't be communicating with you when you're disrespectful to me. We are going to have such a good family life, Janie, Joey. We're going to be respectful. We're going to always talk to each other like we're treasures. We're going to treat each other. Do you know, do you know Jamie, that, that God loves you? Because it's important if you're a Christian or Jewish or, or have any concept of a God. And uh, 
Use it. Use it. Say, God loves you. God loves me. He wants us to treat each other with respect. Love one another as he loves us. He, he wants us to treat one another with respect. And that's what we're going to be doing. And then we're also going to be able to love because we'll be respectful. And I guarantee that this is going to work. That's great. Yeah, I love the, the love and respect as the antidote to psychiatric drugs, right? Yes, absolutely. I love it. And maybe as we're wrapping it up, I just want to have uh, get, have you have a chance to mention your latest book. And this is the latest, latest, hot off the press. Um, well, it's so hot, it's not even <laughs> off the press yet. It's still it's cooking. It's not off the press. It's still cooking. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it? I'm going to put a link to the website, We Are the Prey, uh, in the show notes so people can find out about it. But this is you jumping into fully into COVID-19 and the global predators. Yeah. Well, for Ginger and I decided that we had the skills that a lot of people didn't have from taking on the drug companies for decades and taking on the FDA and these agencies. We just knew stuff other people didn't know and we'd survived. You know, they tried to destroy us completely and we survived. I survived before I knew Ginger and then much better after I had Ginger with me. Mm -hmm. And um, so we finally uh, decided to really go all in and we are pro bono in a major legal case to stop the shutdowns. And um, uh, I'm the medical expert for uh, one of these big cases. It's uh, one of the things we're doing. And out of that really grew the book. And the book is COVID-19 and the Global Predators. And I won't even get into it very much. Uh, it's an expansion of everything I've talked about today because these global predators are the exact same ones who chose to make a market of our children and to lie and use force and threats and intimidate doctors and intimidate uh, parents, make them afraid to, to not put their kid on drugs. It's all the same as in COVID-19. Fear, 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 fear. And um, we talk about that in the book. We talk about who the people are. We talk about all the scientific facts. And the beauty of uh, one of the things about COVID-19 and the global predators that I am so proud of and Ginger is so proud of, we call it at the book, is it has three introductions, short, powerful introductions by the top physicians, my fellow MDs. I never had that taken on psychiatry. It's interesting. Top MDs writing beautiful, powerful introductions. So one of them is uh, Peter McCullough, who is a, a cardiologist and a huge scientist who decided to take on COVID-19 and has done all the wonderful work on how to get real good help for, and the book tells you where to get the help for this, uh, for, for if you do really get COVID-19. And another is um, another physician, a family doctor, um, Zelenko, um, Zev Zelenko, Vladimir Zev Zelenko. I love both these men. I just love them. And, uh, and he's written a one and, and Zev uh, risked his whole life and career to tell the world there's a way to treat COVID-19. You don't have to wait for the vaccines. Just go ahead. We got drugs. And uh, then uh, Elizabeth Lee Vliet, V-L-I-E-T, another MD, who is a great COVID-19 doctor and uh, Together, they, uh, uh, their work has led to, and uh, Peter uh, uh, McCullough and um, Dr. Belit, they both are actually authors of the blue book that I'll tell people how to get it uh, so that they uh, can get to the treatment right away. And um, you can get that by going, going to the website of the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons. Uh, which, if I recall correctly, you can get to more directly than Googling it by uh, going to aapsonline.org, aapsonline.org. Um, but the thing about the book, uh, if you go to the dedicated page or to my website, the dedicated page is um, wearethepray.com. We thought a memorable phrase would be easier than bregan.com even. We are the prey.com. The remarkable thing about that is if you go there before the book is published and 
by the time this film comes out, the book will probably be published. But if you go there before the, the book is published, amazing thing will happen. If you buy it, you will immediately get the manuscript in your email instantly. Nice. Nice. No, no author, as far as I know, in history has ever done this before. And frankly, it was just simply I thought to myself, I'm, I'm, I'm meeting God. And what's one of the questions he's going to ask me? And one of them is going to be, I don't get, Peter, why you waited so long to put out the information you had. I said, well, I was talking about it on the air, but why didn't you just make your book available to the general public? And I thought, I can. It won't be the fi finished book. It will be full of errors and copy editing problems, but I don't have shame on these issues. So if you go now and you sign up and the book isn't out yet, don't worry. You're going to get the manuscript, but most likely you will actually get the book. COVID-19 and the Global Predators and the dedicated website is wearetheprey.com. I love it. I love it. Well, it's been an honor and I certainly appreciate your time and, and all your insights, your beautiful narrative story around the treatment. I, I really, I feel that parents are going to get a lot of value out of this or anyone's going to get a lot of value out of this. Uh, so Dr. Peter Bregan, it's been my pleasure to finally speak with you at great length. And uh, I and everyone that supports our movement uh, certainly supports your take on ADHD uh, supporting your new book, COVID-19 and the Global Predators. We are the prey.com is the website. I'm going to put that in the, the show links. And please tell Ginger as well, your wife, the co-author of the book. Uh, thank you for making this happen. Yes. Uh, I'm really excited to put this out and we'll keep you posted when we do so. And um, wishing you all the best with this new book. Thank you so, so much. Um, it's uh, it's just been wonderful to have you uh, revive in me the the original identity of Dr. Peter Bregan as the conscience of psychiatry. Bless you and good luck. Thank you. <laughs>